coward boy is Krishna, Partha is the calf, Arjuna. People of purified intellects are the drinkers of this milk and the milk is the supreme nectar called the Bhagavad Gita. We are on the second chapter, 68, 64, sorry. But the disciplined yogi moving about the objects of the senses with the senses under control and one who is free from attraction and aversion attains peace. We had seen this is a kind of a continuation of that particular subject matter that as you keep on thinking about a particular thing you get attached to it and after you get attached to it if that attachment is obstructed in any way you become angry and when you get angry you lose your sense of discernment and then you lose your sense of discernment, all your memory goes off. You're just a ball of, you can see, rage and confusion. And if that is the case, then the person perishes. Perishes in the sense that person is, becomes unfit for the human goal. That's liberation. Now, after enumerating the problems faced with letting the senses just run amok amongst, this, amongst the objects of the world, so it gives a kind of a solution. This is a solution. But the disciplined yogi, I mean, a person who is not a yogi also moves about and has to move about. That person just cannot stay in his room or in his kind of uh, meditation cabin all the time. Has to move out. And the non-yogi also has to move about. Obviously, What's the difference between them? The difference is this. But the disciplined yogi moving about objects with the senses in the control, what happens is the senses are kind of very powerful. Very powerful. And they have been kind of let loose from the very beginning. Last time I mentioned it's like a person who has the horses under control and a person who has got his horses not under control. That is, he doesn't have the reins in his hands, his or her hands. Their horses run where they want to. What do you mean horses? In one of the Upanishads called uh, the Kata Upanishad, the illustration, just to kind of a recap, is given as the body is like a chariot. That is can, can be kind of understood. And the chariot needs to be yoked to something, the horses. The horses are the senses. Well, the five senses the sensory, the sensory system is always kind of joined to the motor organs, always. You just cannot have just the senses, sensory system kind of isolated from the motor organs. 
there, are, there is a kind of overlap between them. So the, the senses become like horses, they draw. What do they draw? A person sitting in the chariot. That is the soul of the, the individual soul. But who has the control? It is called the intellect. And the intellect has the reins in his hands. That is, what is joined to the horses is in the hands of this intellect. And that is the mind. So we have a composite picture. We have the horses and the kind of harness which is the mind, the reins which is the mind, in the hands of the intellect, the buddhi. Okay. And the body is the chariot. So this is how we kind of move around. And human life is a kind of a journey, a sort of a journey. And what about that soul of that person there? That person just is there. He's just a traveler. That soul is just a traveler because what happens? All the controls are there. Indirectly, the soul operates everything. But it does not really have a say in the matter. It depends on you. Where do you want to take me? You, you want to take my soul to hell? Well, let's go to hell. <laughs> you want to take me to heaven? Let's go to heaven. Where do you want to take me? So there is a degree of freedom that's given to all of us. And we have to decide where we need to go. We need to have a goal. Just simply not taking the chariot around and round the city. Yeah, you need to go from one place to another. So once you pin your goal, this is what I want to attain. Then everything falls into place. The intellect will start drawing in, controlling the horses. Yes. And we know that the, uh, what we are marked by the neocortex. It has a controlling power over all the other kind of systems that we have. That has to be exercised. When the horses wants to go there, pull them back. No, not there. Here, pull them out. And if they fight, you, you are supposed to fight equally. You don't let, okay, fine, we'll do it tomorrow. No, we'll do it now. Keep on pulling other. This is self-mastery. So a yogi, when a person is moving about, that person's mind is and the senses are perfectly under his or her control. And move about. Yeah, so what is there? But, I say. but in many cases, the power has been given to these sense organs, these horses, and they are dragging us wherever we don't want to. You walk down the streets and your eyes are moving around here, you're listening, all these things. If you are preoccupied with something, you might not even hear anything or see. You might look, but not really see things. Even. So the mind to be engaged has to hold on to some idea, some ideal, some direction, and then it can proceed. See, what happens is, it's very easy to let go. You don't have to do anything. Let the horses go. But to drag the horses back and keep them under control needs strength. So that is the difficult path. The pull. And those guys have been used to f this kind of sensory freedom for so long. And suddenly you are kind of trying to draw them back in. They are going to rebel. They are going to fight back. And that is what spiritual life really is. 
how do the senses operate either as the, the text says either you like it or like a particular thing or dislike a person particular thing and of course between the two you have something called neutral but these two kind of forces are kind of dragging it's a very dynamic process why does the senses and the mind go towards these objects because they are made of the same material one first see it's like you no know, we are breathing here yeah. here yeah, that's half the work those trees are doing another half of the work yeah who oh, really <laughs> yeah it's actually your body is intimately connected to the external world you just can oh no i want the external world is totally different from me you will not be able to eat not be drink water or do anything breathe also so your body and the world makes one continuous existence so this is it and the senses are tailored to apprehend or kind of understand what objects are around the the senses naturally go out and that's how they are tailored we have in one of the upanishads uh again the kata upanishad we have is that the self existent lord made the senses flow outward that is why a person looks outside a certain wise person desiring immortality turns the senses inwards and sees that indwelling soul so now we can understand that to see that soul of yours you need to turn your gaze inwards well, well it's called pran chikhani vratnat swayam so the self existent lord made the senses go outward and injured them this is what happened so in society we when we are using one object for some time you get kind of disgusted with it and then yet that old memories and old taste for that is lingering so you you it's like wetting the cloyed senses we kind of sharpen our senses more and more for that particular thing so i want more and more and more and more this is the principal bondage of a embodied being if you can get away from that well you have conquered everything so this is the idea behind the disciplined yogi moving about the objects with the senses under control light senses are not kind of attracted toward a particular thing not deflected from a particular thing like no attraction and repulsion something attracts us and after a while repulses us you got oh enough of this and the senses have a kind of a limitation you can do the same thing over and over and over and over again there is a kind of a reaction that's a law of karma and you you do a particular thing over and over again you're caught in that channel and the, you're flowing through that and then comes a reaction every you can say impulse that goes out comes as a reaction so when there is no reaction at all the senses are not flowing out you kind of curb them so what happened the mind and the senses are under your grip you attain tranquility you attain peace people say where is there is no peace yes there is peace they cannot say there is no peace all the scriptures and all the wise people are saying there is peace yes how where well curb your senses well, sometimes the kind of solution is greater than the problem 
Yeah. It's like, no. Swami Vivekananda says, a man desiring to kill a mosquito sitting on his friend's head gives it such a whack. The mosquito gets killed and the person also gets killed. <laughs> injured. So sometimes the solution solution is worse than the disease or the medicine is kind of tough. Oh. But if you really want peace, we all want peace. It's not that people are fools. No, everyone wants peace. They want happiness. But they are looking in the wrong direction. They should have been looking inside. They are looking for peace outside. And then, yes, come, come. And you have caught up in that snares. And then you are dragged and dragged. You say, I came here for peace. Oh, no. Saying Swami Vivekananda says, the honeybee came to suck honey and its feet got stuck up in that honey. We are exactly there. We've got so much honey. Yeah, wow. We jump inside and you got stuck up. So, where do you want that peace? You are already possessing. You possess that peace. Only what happened is, it is as it were reflected outside. And you see, this thing will give me peace. This thing will give me peace. This thing there. We have made the first mistake. So, to correct ourselves, remember that the peace is within. There. So what's, what's there outside? It's a semblance. Don't get caught up there. So, but then if you keep on controlling your senses, how do you operate? Oh, you will operate. What happens is the energy that flows out is contained. The senses become extremely subtle and sharp. You will be able to see things much more clearly. Your insights will become much more clear. This is as the Gita will say, initially it appears like nectar. Oh, so beautiful. And after you go towards that, it turns venom, poisonous. And this pursuit of peace, oh, it looks so terrible and so grueling. It's like poison in the beginning. But later that poison turns into nectar. So, there it is. Besides, you must have some mastery over yourself. And nobody has told us. Oh, you are alright. You can do whatever you want. You can be whatever you want. Really? Ask them. You would be whatever you want. No, you are always acting and reacting on the world and the world is not going to give you everything on the platter yeah please take it no you have to fight every inch of the way so here we are though we are connected very intimately with the world yet the world is not going to give it give things to you very easily you will have to struggle and for that struggle you need to be a master and that mastery is Otherwise, we are like slaves. We slavishly follow this and slavishly follow that and we become a slave for this and that and this and hundreds of... And people say, oh yes, we are free in a free country. See? Really? <laughs> then once your senses are under your control, you will understand what is really freedom. That's a Tremendous sense of achievement, a tremendous sense of conquest, a tremendous sense of power that comes within you. Yes. People, you know, are, like I say, they are dragged from here, one place to another, another, another. Once you know you are under control, then the world will give things to you 
प्लीज टेक दिस प्लीज टेक दिस प्लीज टेक दिस आई डोंट वॉन्ट दिस आई वॉन्ट दैट देर इट इज सो दिस काइंड ऑफ पुट्स इन टू परस्पेक्टिव वॉट वी आर सपोज टू डू या वॉट आर द इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स एंड हाउ दिस बिकॉज लाइक बोथ दीज फोर्सेज वन इज काइंड ऑफ सर्कलिंग आउटसाइड there's a count of force pulling you back and we are kind of churned our mind and our senses are churned between these two forces one circling outside another kind of circling inside and all joy sorrows love hatred good bad are nothing but a manifestation of these two forces yes sometimes i'm happy sometimes i'm sad oh really yeah we are suppo- you are you are in the whirlpool that's the word pull you are in so we have of course thank god the senses are extremely limited it cannot read everything that comes in and it's not possible and it's not necessary also that every sensation that comes through the senses in the mind should be looked at should be recognized should be interpreted and should be saved no our senses are very limited compared to a dog a cat an eagle any you take any kind of any animal and their senses are much stronger very strong in fact our senses are very limited you ask a dog uh, the dog knows before hand i say my friend is going to come you know i know he's down there down the street <laughs> he he'll be coming soon and we like fools we are using the phone. how are you where are you <laughs> so why is that they are all their life is in the senses they are just in the sensory mood nothing but so we have something called the vital force or life force that's called prana so it is all put into these sensory systems of us, of theirs so their whole life is on the sensate level nothing but on the sensory level they cannot think of any other higher things oh yes so the second solution is you shift your center of gravity shift the center of existence towards your life force towards the intellect then the senses will become weakened as you say your life will not be in the senses not a sensate life your life will be then in the mind you live more in the mind and generally humans are like that we actually live more in the mind than in the body Yes. A nice word can make your day. And something happens and then finish your f- your shattered. Oh, what? Something some one word or two words can shatter your day or shatter your life. What's this? So we live more in our minds. Now we need to shift our life force in the intellect. you must be discerning uh, what's that then you know that yes i can understand these things see what happens is this pleasure seeking because on the sensory level it's just pleasure and pain we avoid pain and seek pleasure and every every embodied thing being does that we avoid pleasure and seek uh, avoid a uh, pain and we seek pleasure and that's what you know, who wants to hug pain <laughs> but then what happens is we are, we, are, we seek for pleasure and that pleasure rewards us initially and then draws us back in so the whole your yeah, nervous system is tailored for that only you do it once and then the brain will reward you there 
you go it go for it for second time and the third time and you're hooked so here yeah, sometimes uh, we find we kind of so silly we have to break that kind of loop that has been created and that loop can be broken by the intellect once that life force has kind of gone down there to the intellect it can see where i am misstepping and i can break that loop then what happens hell you become free that's what it is so this is from the standpoint of you can say knowledge yoga gyan yoga everybody is not kind of competent for this everybody is saying oh you see uh, you know i'm a poor person and i cannot i don't have any spirituality but what should i do there's a innate love for god also so bhakti yoga steps in you know bhakti yoga is the devotional aspect of your the so it's okay what you do is you use your senses oh huh? really yes you use your senses in order to worship god there every ritual is designed to do exactly that well you can first wave lights and then wave incense and then you offer this thing to this that deity you're using your senses but now the senses are now now you can say attached only to things which you are in the part of the worship you're worshiping the deity through the senses through these objects and here so if you we can do that whatever i hear whatever i think whatever i speak whatever i do is a kind of a worship and offering to god so bhakti yoga says well it's difficult for you yes use this system so when i'm eating yeah i need to eat try to think that yes actually i'm feeding that deity with which is within me i take a rose and but do it for the deity within this is another a uh, step higher if you can do that offer that flower to the deity in front there it is uh, the picture or a statue or something like that well here it is have everything clean and nice and spick and span and do everything for the deity externally and slowly slowly you can do it then internally so this path is sure it is slow but of course it depends on how intense you make that effort so so they said use all the senses and these are the objects worship god through this ha ah, that's a nice one so you want a kind of a uh, you're feeling hot you wave a kind of a fan yeah first you wave it first to the deity that's the idea and then wave it to you there yeah. then what happens is the concept of uh, the worship is sight sound taste smell and all these things no all these senses they are very dominant so they arise from sight arises from fire or light taste from water and then the smell from the earth okay. and hearing is from space and touch is kind of the air you know so all these five senses are connected very intimately to the five great elements earth water fire ether and you can say water earth water fire ether and air ether is space so these senses and these external this external world now a kind of conjoint and you offer all these things to the deity 
So when we see in this kind of this worship, that's a kind of a perfect way to kind of control your senses. Yeah. So your breath is kind of very kind of erratic. Well, you can calm your breath, do kind of pranayama. If your mind is very restless, do meditation on the deity, all this. If your senses are very strong, you say, yeah, this you can say, this touch is nothing but a touch which is from the air, you know. When the breeze blows, you feel a sense of touch. You offer that to God. So you are not only offering your senses and sensory objects, but the whole of this kind of creation. Because we are a composite of all these five great elements. Earth, water, fire, air and space. So you are using this external world and your senses to worship. So this, this it's a kind of a it's a kind of a, quite a, a profound uh, subject. This is a much easier way. That's a, that's the reason why they said try to kind of be worshipful. Try to have prayer in your life. Prayer not for oh God give me this, give me that, give me this, give me that. No, don't don't. Uh, so. Give me strength, give me courage, give me redundancy, give me knowledge. That kind of, those are prayers, real prayers. Then what happens is your senses and all these things gradually come under control. Your mind comes under control. And that, that is what. So the external elements make the same composition here in our body. And the same composition is in our senses. So, these things are not inimical. They are not enemies now anymore. These are means for my worship. And then it becomes kind of, ha. Ah. So, whatever you do later on, so whatever you do, whatever you see, whatever you smell, whatever you taste, whatever you, whatever you think, do it as an offering to me. It's wonderful. The moment you offer it, to the to the deity or to your own higher self you have the lower self enmeshed in this body and senses and mind but you have another higher self do it for the higher self and you will see the changes no longer are you tugged by this uh, good and bad and it all belongs to the lord like you know in uh, in sanskrit the gang uh, the Ganga Jale Ganga Puja. That is, when you worship the Ganga, how do you worship the Ganga? That's a kind of a sacred river. How do you worship? With actually Ganga water only. You don't take any other water. No other water will do when you worship. The. So when you're worshipping the deity within, how do you worship? By what the deity has already created. Worship the deity with what? His own creation. Wow, that's a good thing. So all the senses now become kind of docile. Yes, it's meant, the, all these things are meant to be offered to the Lord. And there are various hymns in, uh, you can say in Sanskrit, that tell you whatever you do, yeah, you're walking around as if you're circumambulating the deity. When you speak as if you're uttering some mantras for the deity. So, your whole consciousness gets changed. With the change in your perception about your own self, your whole life becomes a kind of a worship. So this is another major path to the divine. This is one path, pull. Another one, eh, I can't pull, I can't pull anymore. Well, okay, let go and now Change your conception about these things. Then that enemies, these enemies which you are, no longer are your enemies, they become friendly. Okay. So we go to the next one, 65. Wow. I'll, I'll just read the Sanskrit. For 
64 ragadvesh vyuktaistu vishayanindriyaischaran atmavaishyer videyatma prasadam adigachati adigachati attains prasadam tranquility peace videyatma one who is self controlled that is one who is using the mind to control the senses so this is and all these objects everything when we emerge when your consciousness emerges out it's called a waking state when you're seeing it engages only with the objects nothing else you can just go into a room close it and keep quiet and turn turn off the light and sit down quietly you see what happens it will there will be a bigger reaction that's why they say that solitary confinement is a worst form of torture ask a person to keep quiet they uh, seem possible so these guys they, they make any mischief in the in the yeah put them in solitary confinement they cannot see anything hear anything they shout the whole cell is padded they bang their head here and nothing happens they are there and then the inner devils all come out yes all these thing people say yeah we we took this kind of drug and we saw this and that i said you don't even need to take those kind of uh psychedelic drugs you don't need to go into a quiet room put uh, put uh, turn off the lights and be quiet they see what happens all your senses will deceive you and your mind will play tricks and then you oh my god yes so you don't need to take psychedelic drugs you can go that's a better way <laughs> of getting into th- if you want to see things some stupid things <laughs> so we go to the next one prasade sarva dukkhanam hani rasyopajayate prasann chetaso hyasu buddhir paryavatishtati it's a beautiful they say in tranquility in peace when everything has become kind of peaceful here within all the sorrows are destroyed for the intellect of the tranquil minded is soon fully established in equilibrium this so here what makes us sick what makes us stupid is we have given free reins to the senses the moment we have taken away that freedom come back all the senses come back then what have in that tranquility you destroy sorrow yes oh i'm very sorrowful yeah you, we know why you're sorrowful so the calculation is kind of equation is kind of correct you're sorrowful yeah i'm struggling yeah i know i'm in pain yes, yes. i'm in misery yes yes i know we all know why because for so long you had just let yourself go now when you brought yourself back the first thing that you you attain is the end of sorrow yes now you see suppose i'm walking down the road and a kind of a lightning comes and boom hits me that's okay that's certain things are not in my hand okay or i'm walking down or driving down a tree comes and boom falls on my car what can i do about it so those things kind of these are external things but of course what is more kind of pain producing is this inner world of mine so once i've got these things under my kind of control okay so the tree has fallen okay fine the tree is fall down what do, what what do you expect <laughs> they keep on growing forever <laughs> no, one day they'll fall down and lightning here less 
<laughs> Thank God you have lightning. In this world, this earth is kind of alive. The atmosphere is alive. If it was a dead world, there would be no lightning. <laughs> and no thunder. <laughs> and no rain and nothing. So you can expect all this. So, so we can expect these things. So you, it won't kind of rattle you. It won't bother you. This is the nature of the external world. Fine. Yes, okay. This is but the inner sorrows will be destroyed. Then what happens? Then that intellect which was kind of dormant suddenly becomes awakened. This is a kind of awakening that spiritual aspirants want. How does it become awakened? Yeah, it becomes awakened. When you come to that part, you will understand how it becomes awakened. Suddenly, wow. See, what happens is, this, we think we are very intelligent. Sri Ramakrishna says, yes, even the crow thinks it's very intelligent. You know what the crow eats. Similarly, this intelligence of ours has made us so miserable. If we are so intelligent, why should we be miserable? We should have been happy. There is something wrong there somewhere. So, the moment the intellect is freed from the thaldrum of the senses, the mind, it becomes awakened. It knows its true purpose. And then you can... People say, I've been doing meditation for years and years and years. Nothing seems to be happening. Well... What do you expect? Sri Ramakrishna gives the example. A couple of guys who had a little extra drink, they, they go down to the banks of the river and they sit down in a boat and they ah, hey, come on, let's get, and they're singing and this and that. And they take the oars and keep on rowing. Let's get down. And when it's daybreak, the whole night they keep on rowing. When it's daybreak, they find... They forgot to lift the anchor and the boat is exactly where it was. They rode the whole night and so most of us kind of are in that situation. And we have been doing this for some years and this and that but nothing seems to be happening. You are there, you lift that anchor up and then you see yourself speeding down. So. If somebody was a little sober in that group, hey you guys, <laughs> lift that anchor up. That is that intellect. It's aware of things. Lift it. It's aware of my own weaknesses, my own strength. It doesn't matter. We all have weaknesses. But it does not kind of apologize. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so miserable. I'm a worm. I don't live, need to, I don't deserve to live and this and that. No! That intellect will not apologize to anything or anyone, especially to yourself. Don't kind of go and degrade yourself. I'm, I'm such a miserable person, I don't, you can say, deserve to live. Let's go and commit suicide. Here you go. You're kind of stupid. The world is kind of less stupid now. You go on. Well, problem with that guy comes again. <laughs> the intellect will not apologize. It will understand these are my strengths and these are my weaknesses and I have to use my strength to overcome these weaknesses and I proceed. This is what happens. We are sometimes very self-denigrating. You know, we kind of very, some, we are critical of others we don't like somebody's dress and we don't like somebody's clothes. We don't like somebody's shoes and we don't like somebody's hairstyle. We don't like... You keep on. Oh, that's useless. That's kind of cheap. The cheapo. <laughs> but when there are no people, then what happens is that critical attitude comes within us and then what we do is that's a mistake we do. We keep on talking to ourselves. That mental chatter. That will stop. 
and that is a big obstruction. So when the intellect is awakened, that mental chatter will go disappear. That critical, <laughs> you get the criticism for others will also go. People are like this. This person is like this. Accept that person as that person is. Don't push your expectations on that person. I wish that guy would have been taller. I wish that guy would have become have been more richer. No, you do. You don't expect it. this. Is the world you will see the world as a kind of a neutral agent. You will see it as it. Is. Yeah, this is what it is. Oh, oh. We have not really accepted the world as it is. We want to put our own ideas on the world. The world should have been like this. That guy, whoever, whoever was there, who has created this kind of mess. <laughs> One Swami Vivekananda quoting, I think it was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, some English uh, philosopher. This is a devil's world. I could have created a better world. Sri Ramakrishna. I think it was John Stuart Mill, if I'm not, if not mistaken. So Sri Ramakrishna looks at him, how much of the world do you know to say this? And Swami Vivekananda kept quiet. Yeah, we don't know anything of this world. We think we know. Uh, so, so there are so many forces in nature, mental and physical. The diversity is staggering. It's just impossible to understand the world in very simple terms. It's a very, very complex, very, very complex, you can say, existence. Very complex. So we try to kind of simplify it according to our own likes and dislikes. This should, world should have been like this. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't conform to your. If everybody and everybody has an idea, the world should have been like this. Well, everybody is wrong. Then <laughs> the world does not listen to you. So this is what happens in tranquility. When that person is tranquil, all the sorrows are destroyed. First thing, is destruction. Why? Because. The mind's restlessness creates these sorrows. It's called that rajoguna. The, the mind, when it's whipped, mind and senses, when they are whipped out by these two forces of attraction and repulsion, it, can, uh, it, can, it becomes very sorrowful. That's a rajoguna. Tamoguna is like everything is kind of sleepy and you're indolent and lazy. And it doesn't make a difference to you whether you wake up at 4 o'clock or whether you wake up at 6 o'clock or whether you wake up at 10 o'clock. It doesn't make any difference to me. Oh, God. That's kind of tamas, darkness, covering, indolence, lassitude. And then the mind becomes sattva, that is pure, limpid, luminous. And it starts kind of spreading itself around. That is a state of mind that we all would need. That sattva guna is everywhere in our bodies. But it is kind of overpowered by the rajaguna and tamaguna. Guna are the qualities. These are the qualities of nature. So, and then what happens? So that intellect of that, in that tranquil minded, in that sattva state, the person, and later the Bhagavad Gita will say, what happens? Sarva dware shudehe smin prakash mupajayate. Through all the senses, as if light flows out, through all your body, light flows out. What's light? Light of knowledge. Prakash mupajayate. Jnanam yada tada vidya So, the light of knowledge, the intellect was kind of sleepy for so long. Suddenly it becomes awakened and become awake and then it becomes luminous. And that luminosity kind of flows out 
through your senses and through your body and through your mind. That is what we would require. Yeah. And then you see, you kind know, of, whatever you see, whatever you say, whatever you touch and sense and feel and do, you think, it is now luminous to you. The sense objects no longer can betray you. They don't betray you. They, they, they become all your friends. The whole world becomes such a blissful place because you already finished off your sorrow. And with the rise of this luminosity, this knowledge, everything becomes blissful. Ah, you as if like you know, walk on air. You know? Yes, you feel that kind of uh, joy, spontaneous joy welling up inside you. Kind of, Sri Ramakrishna one time, he is kind of uh, pacing up and down, you know, kind of. And one of the disciples seeing him, and Sri Ramakrishna beaming, you know, everything is beaming. You see children when they kind of, uh, they, they have no cares, no worries, nothing. You know. And when they are happy, see how they kind of, they are beaming. For what? What is the reason why they are beaming? <laughs> Nothing. There is no particular reason. They are simply smiling and laughing and beaming. Yeah. You see that? That's what we will become. There is no particular reason why you are happy. Why do you need a reason to be happy? Yeah. Very strange. You just be happy. You're peaceful. Your sorrows ended. You're very happy. So, uh, somebody was, uh, long time back I heard, they was singing a song, Don't worry, be happy. So I said, yeah, good. <laughs> yes. If wishes were horses and beggars would ride, you know, they say. Hey, you just wish, that won't do. You'll have to Make your mind and your senses and your body in that state of sattva. So, in this state, what happens? This person becomes fully established in that consciousness, that absolute consciousness. Yes. So, there it is. The next verse kind of follows this, this trend, kind of it's extension of the same idea. We will take it up and say, There is no wisdom for the fickle-minded, for the restless. Nor is there meditation for them. When the mind is restless, you can't meditate. To the unmeditative, there is no peace. And how can the person who does not have peace ever enjoy happiness? Ah, there. It's a kind of... There. You start here, <laughs> end up where you say. So, he's saying, there is no wisdom in a restless mind. The mind has to be quiet, placid. Why? Because it can see its own depths. When the water of the lake is choppy, there is wind blowing and waves kind of you know, covering the whole lake, you can see the bottom of that lake. When the winds have stopped, the winds of attachment and aversion have stopped, the water becomes calm and then you can see the bottom of that lake. That's what actually it is. So that wisdom which is there comes out. So for the fickle-minded, for the restless, there is no meditation. You cannot have meditation there. It's like we've been meditating for so many years. Somebody is saying we meditate like this and meditate like that. Yes, we know what's your meditation like. Most of your meditation is on, oh my back is aching now, my leg is tingling and I think there's, uh, there's a message come on my phone. <laughs> I 
My friend must be waiting there. So you are meditating on all these things. We know of meditation. <laughs> you need to draw your mind away from that. And then fix it. If you have drawn your mind away from the external world, okay, now it is time for dinner, right? because I am hungry. Yeah. Then you meditate, you are meditating on the body. And then after sometimes, when you rise above your meditation, you keep on persisting in meditating, then you are meditating on your subconscious mind. All, all the kind of dirt and the garbage and the kinds of trash coming out. You are meditating on that. Oh, what's meditation? <laughs> you are meditating on your own trash? No, no. You need to recycle the whole thing. Throw it out. And then when you have conquered that, then that is meditation. So if you don't meditate, for a person does, who does not meditate, there is no peace. And how can happiness ever arise when there is no peace, uh, placidity, happiness? Where does this happiness arise from? That's the question. Well, it arises from your own consciousness. That's why in Vedanta, the terminology is given is existence, consciousness, bliss. They are not three things. It's one thing. It is existence. That existence is consciousness. And that consciousness is bliss. So that's where you, all that bliss come, kind, of, kind of pours out. So there you are. So when the mind has become placid, everything has become quiet, the intellect has awakened, become luminous, there the bliss which is your nature comes forth. Nasti buddhi rayuktasya nacha yuktasya bhavana nacha bhavayata shanti rashantasya kutasukam We will discuss this in the next uh, Gita class a little and then we will proceed. He gives those solutions. Thank you. Om Shanti 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 Hi Hari Hi Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rapanamastu